Hey. Well, congratulations, <laughs> by the way, all confirmands and those, the, the one person who's being received into uh, our, our portion of the, the Church of God. Um, our bishop is here, Mark Balakas, of course, and so this time is basically just an opportunity for you to hear from him um, what he's seeing going on within the church in general, um, our own diocese, the, the larger national church, and maybe even the Anglican communion around the world. Um, one great thing about, you know, I only get to worship with a bishop like once a year, like when you do. And, and what's really cool, every time that I'm with the bishop, uh, he, he comments through things throughout the service in a great way. I mean, not in a bad way. And today, <laughs> and, and you'll, you'll, you'll appreciate this about your bishop. Uh, today, he, when, when they were reading the first John lesson, which is a great lesson for St. John's, um, he says, I just love this. And the entire time that it was being read, he goes, hmm, yeah. And you just hear him comment to himself. And so, uh, one, Mutter, muttering one great to himself. Piece of information for you is our bishop loves scripture, That's which right. is it's which true. is uh, wonderful. It's anyway, a good thing. welcome. Thank I'm you, glad sir. you're here, and please just kind of share with us. Yeah, sure, sure. One of the things that um, maybe that's a good um, segue. Uh, well, good morning, I should have said first. It's good to be with you all. That's a good segue. Um, one of the things about the, the the first letter of John is it's strong in its. Um, and talking about the way God loves us uh, deeply, and it then turns and points us in the direction of loving, of loving uh, our neighbors, our brothers and sisters in Christ. And it's really strong making that connection. Like, you can't just do one. Can I love God and not deal with all those people? Right? You know, that, 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 that's tempting, right? It's the people that, that are the hard part. Right? But, but, but in that letter, and I don't mean to get into an exegesis on... Um, John's letter, but, but, when, but there's, there's a really hard uh, or strong part when, um, when, when John writes, anyone who says they love God and hates a brother and sister is a liar. Well, that's, that's rough, right? But uh, John means to sort of point to that, that the love that we show to other people or the way that we learn to express the love that we know in, in Christ Jesus uh, to others is the way that we, that we know um, really know God. So with that, uh, I don't know if I'll be able to cover all the things that, um, that Eric uh, laid out there. They, those are like separate classes, but each one. But, I, but what I thought I'd start with, because today is, is these uh, Confirmands Day. Uh, that's their day. And I'd like to say a few words to them, and I think you all will be able to benefit from that, I hope. Uh, so, you know, you can think about your own baptismal calling. So let's, um, if you're being confirmed today, raise your hand. All right. Fantastic. Okay. So, how many of you all uh, were uh, baptized as children? How many of you be, be, that being? Right. And, and were you babies? Everyone is holding their hand up? Mostly? Young child? Ten. Ten. Right. Anybody, um, is, um, so David, 10 years old, anybody who was not a baby also? You were not a baby? And how old were you? 13? So you, oh, that's, oh, right, so, you, so you're, you're right on track, right? You, you've already said, I'm definitely on, this, on track here. Anybody else? Adult. Adult. Uh, how old? Anybody from uh, other traditions, other denominational traditions? I assume a lot of you. Okay, good. So tell me the, the different traditions. Presbyterian. Presbyterian. Baptist. Baptist. Okay, I'll come back to that. <laughs> uh, I don't mean it that way, but I mean it's helpful to have some variety. That's what I mean to say. Presbyterian. Presbyterian. Methodist and Baptist. Methodist and Baptist. Catholic. Catholic. Good. That, does that get everything? Lutheran cousins um, and Methodist cousins too. One of the reasons I said I'd come back to Bat, uh, Baptists is um, there is a different understanding in the Baptist church than there is in some of these other mainline denominations, including us, the nature of baptism. Uh, first of all, uh, in a lot of Baptist churches and a lot of free churches, uh, they, they do more than, they, they baptize more than once or can. You know, if you weren't immersed in another tradition, then we want you to immerse you here. Or if you backslide or something, then you know we need to immerse you again because it didn't take um, something like that. 
Um, and, and that's why, just for all of you, it's, it's, it's important to understand that, that when we say we believe in one baptism, or I say there is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, it, it's, it's that Catholic and universal, I don't mean Roman Catholic, I mean Catholic and universal way of saying that we're all baptized into Christ, right? So you're not baptized into the Episcopal Church, you're not baptized in the Presbyterian Church or the Baptist Church, you're baptized into Christ, right? Uh, it just happens that you get enrolled uh, wherever you're baptized, and that, that sort of by default makes you that because you continue to journey there, uh, but we are baptized first and foremost in Christ, right? One baptism. Once we're baptized, we're good, right? So no offense to the Baptist Church. It's just to say that we understand it differently. And the reason I asked um, um, how many of you were baptized as uh, babies is to say that one of the things uh, that we emphasize by baptizing babies, anybody know why we baptize babies or what we mean to say when we do that? Some of you have heard me say this before, so no? anybody want to take a, take a guess? I thought it was a medieval There is a medieval understanding, which is like uh, the sort of limbo baby thing, or that you know, if you didn't baptize the baby, then what would happen if they died? That had to do, a lot to do with infant mortality at the time. That's not really the reason. That, that's a reason maybe you want to get the baby baptized, uh, but I don't think in God's economy that matters much. I don't think God's going to be like, oh, I'm baptized. Um, <laughs> uh, but I'll come back to that. Um, any, any other guesses? I mean, that's a real thing, but it's not the answer. The main reason, and, and I'll speak for our Episcopal tradition, and it's true in many others, is that we emphasize God's grace. That's the most important thing, right? That we don't do anything to earn baptism or to earn our way into the faith, right? God just loves us. That's another thing that's good about the first letter of John. Um, God loved us first, right? First. We didn't do anything to earn God's love. God just loves us. And so in the moment of baptism, water's just poured over us, right? Um, sometimes a little too meagerly. Uh, it's one of the things that the Baptists sort of get kind of right. It's like, you're going to get in there, right? Right? Um, but, but still, that water is that outward invisible sign. Uh, you all have learned that a sacrament is an outward invisible sign of an inward and spiritual grace. So that outward invisible sign is water, right? There's other outward invisible signs uh, that we use throughout worship, bread, wine, um, sometimes uh, incense for smell, music, things we hear. They are outward signs uh, of things that we can smell, see, touch, um, taste, so that we can um, point to something more important. So, um, the, the grace that we have in baptism is what you're confirming today, right? So, you just a few weeks ago ha were baptized, and um, you could have been confirmed that very moment if I'd have been here. Um, but uh, today, we'll, we'll sort of, um, uh, you'll make that public uh, sort of affirmation again, which you already made. But the rest of you, somebody made that... Um, those vows for you, or, or said, we will raise this child in the Christian life and faith, or, or we, we do desire for this child to be in, in, in Christ's body, the church. So today what you're doing very simply, and you know this, is you're just confirming uh, what was done for you when you were little. Right? You're, you're standing up there yourself. And so when I say, I guess you've all practiced, but when I say, do you renounce Satan and all the evil forces that rebel against God, you'll say, a hearty, I do. A hearty I do, not, not maybe I'll still be with evil sometimes, but <laughs> well, I, all the time, I do. And then will you accept Jesus as your Lord? And, you, and you'll say the, the line that corresponds there, which is also hearty. I, I do desire to follow in this faith. Now, just a, just a word about um, what it means to uh, then continue in this faith. Um, at this moment, as especially you, uh, those of you who are younger, those of you who are coming or older, you probably really sorted this thing out by now, and you're saying, this is where I'm going to be, you know, till the end, uh, hopefully. But, but those of you who are younger, maybe you're here because your parents uh, want you to be here, or you've grown up, that's how I was, I grew up in the Episcopal Church, and by God, my parents said, you're going to be confirmed in the Episcopal Church, and I'm still here, uh, but um, you, might, you might go in another way, you know, you might go, you might become a Methodist, you might become a Lutheran, who knows, who you marry, what, what, um, what um, things the Holy Spirit might have in store for your life. The important thing is, as a child of God, uh, baptized into Christ, your journey is good, you know, whether you journey off into uh, another denomination, and 
you know, maybe even in another faith. That's not what I hope for you, but, 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 but the most important thing is it's not about which church one is sojourning in or being a pilgrim in at that moment. Uh, I think it's critically important if I'm talking uh, from a person of faith who's an Episcopalian, but I'm talking in a larger sense, our journeys are in Christ. And so um, don't feel like you're betraying your parents or your grandparents if you, you know, become a Lutheran uh, or, 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 God forbid, a Baptist. No, I'm just kidding. Um, you know, so it really doesn't, really doesn't matter, right? Uh, it ma- you see, when I say it doesn't matter, I'm talking about the big doesn't matter, not, not the more particular doesn't matter, because I think there's some things about the unique way that we're the Episcopal Church that matter. Um, but, I, but I want, first and foremost, for to hear that it's God's love uh, in, in the risen Christ that we all worship and we're there. Any questions about that piece before I talk about confirmation, about uh, what my role in confirmation is? Any? any? All the young people are either like, oh, it's, really, it's really early. All right. uh, but any, any questions? Okay, well, let me just say then something about the Episcopal Church and my role in uh, confirming you this morning. One of the reasons I like to spend just a little bit of time with you all is so that, you know, when we get to that moment, it's not awkward and weird. You know, at least you've spent a little time with me. He seems okay. Um, kind, of, kind of thing. Instead of that moment, you're just kind of going, why is this guy, you know, putting his hands on my head? Um, so again, the most important thing that's happening in that moment when I put my hands on your head is a spiritual thing. Uh, since, the, since the early church, since the early disciples, the laying on of hands has been the way that we um, pass on leadership, the way we pass on blessing. It goes all the way from things like confirmation all the way up to the ordination of a priest or a deacon. So, um, so it's that outward invisible sign, my hands on your head, uh, which again goes all the way back to the early church. So you're a part of something that's been going on for a couple thousand years or more. Uh, those early disciples, they laid their hands on others and said, we can't, we can't take care of all of Greece, so here, you, 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 go help us. All right? That was part of the, part of the thing. And, so, um, and we pray for the Holy Spirit to be present in that moment. So we don't know how the Holy Spirit is present. The Holy Spirit is a mysterious uh, presence. But we pray for that. And so, most importantly, my hands on your head are an outward invisible sign of the Holy Spirit's active movement in your lives. Whether you know what that's about, have any idea what it's about, uh, where it's going to take you, that's, that's a whole uh, another thing that the Holy Spirit might be about in your life. So, again, that's the, that's the big picture. Uh, the more, um, the little bit smaller picture, but still equally important is, you might ask, why, why am I the one laying hands on and not Eric or Melissa or, or anybody else in this room? Well, as the, um, as the bishop, I'm the um, sign of unity uh, in these parts, right, in southwestern Virginia. I'm connected with all of our other bishops who are a sign of our larger mission as the Episcopal Church, uh, going again, going all the way back uh, to the Apostles. So um, when I lay my hands on your head, not only are we praying for the Holy Spirit to be present, but in that moment you were also connected um, to the Episcopal Church and all your brothers and sisters. I mean, I confirmed a whole bunch of people last week. I'll confirm a whole bunch of people next week. And um, you're connected to them. They're your brothers and sisters. They're like your cousins, right? Maybe you never see them. Uh, you never go to the beach with them. But uh, they're still your cousins, right? So, um, so in that way, because you're confirmed, whether you're an adult coming from another tradition or, or, a, or a young person that's been in this tradition, um, uh, you remain in, in, in this stream of Christ's body, the church, the Episcopal Church, right? So those of you who are already in it, you're just confirming that this is my journey, this is my walk with Jesus here at St. John's in the Episcopal Church, check. If you're coming from another tradition, you're saying, I've been here and now I'm I've been there, and now I'm here. And, and so that um, laying on of hands also has the function of, you know, Eric will list you in the book, and I'll sign uh, saying, you're here. And so you'll be an Episcopalian uh, as long as you're here, which means you could serve on a vestry. God forbid. Uh, but or, <laughs> so this is a, it's one, one of the reasons people don't get confirmed, right? <laughs> I, I'm not confirmed. I can't serve on a vestry. <laughs> so, 
but, but you have to be confirmed to serve on a vestry. So there's some, some things about being in the Episcopal Church. And I, I've been in churches that have had people come from a lot of different traditions, and they really didn't have an, a, a need to be confirmed. We would have confirmation classes, and I'd say, you know, Jim, how come you don't ever want to be confirmed? You know, I'm in the Methodist Church. My mom would kill me if I left, you know, and it's cool. And so that's fine. I mean, right? He doesn't have to be. He can be worshiping. You're a member of St. John's, whether you're confirmed or not, right? If you're here participating with, with brothers and sisters, you're a member. Confirm, confirmation is just saying, uh, along with confirming your baptism, is saying, this is the church uh, that I'm committed to, right? Okay. That's the end of the confirmation baptism uh, piece. Any questions about any of that? I mean, it can be silly questions. They can be, I really always wanted to know. I was afraid to ask. All right, everybody's either, is either just really uh, knows everything or uh, doesn't want to be the first person to say something. Okay, well then, then maybe we could move um, to what's our time like, Eric? Someone keeps me keep me honest about the time. Oh yeah, one person's being received. Well, who's that? And and from what tradition? Okay, so um, one thing to say about that with with Lutherans uh, who we are in uh, communion with now, and with those from the Orthodox Church and the Roman Catholic Church, um, because we have the same pattern of confirmation, that is by a bishop, uh, and the same uh, theological understanding, for the most part, not in every instance, um, of, 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 the, of, the, of the Christian journey in the church, um, there's, first of all, no reason, uh, tell me your name, and to be reconfirmed, just like there's no reason for Anne to be rebaptized. Um, so we just receive her into this, and that's a nice sign. We receive you into this you know, part of, the, of, the, of, of Christ's body of the church, right? And a sign of that is I'll hold my hand out, and you'll take my hand, and I'll say, we receive you into this, you know, part of the church, and then I'll lay my hands on you. So, so again, um, the nice symbol in that is that we're not saying, eh, you know, Roman Catholics, Baptists, whatever. We're saying, we, we receive you. The reason that there is confirmation, say, from the Baptist church is you will not usually practice confirmation. It's not, it's not a right. Uh, and I mean R-I-T-E, in, in the Baptist church. So it's something that's not done. In other places, it's done sometimes by a minister, uh, which is, doesn't make it sort of less valid in a way, but it's just not the way we do it. So usually we will, we will work out, depending on the denomination, what, what's the best way to either receive or confirm uh, a person into this, into this body of the church. And most of that stuff is sort of... Uh, the sort of legal matters, like putting you in the book. Like we don't poach sheep off of other people unless they want to be poached. Uh, or, they, or they come willingly, I should say. <laughs> they left the sheepfold there on their own. Okay. Uh, any other questions? Sure? No questions? All right. Um, so our time is like what, did you say? Uh, about 20, 25 minutes. Okay, so if we have 20 minutes... I could, I could go off in a lot of different directions, but is there anybody who would uh, like to ask a question about something else other than um, um, baptism confirmation? And, if, and again, if you think of a baptism confirmation question, you can bring that up again uh, and see if there are any questions or like, I really wondered this about the diocese, the national church, the worldwide Anglican communion. Now, come on, all you young people been in classes every week or maybe you don't they learned have a it all. Single question, and I keep looking at my own daughter. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's that's, embar that's, em that's embarrassing. My, my kid, my kids hate it when I do that. <laughs> well, they don't have a choice. Call them out. <laughs> that's right. Anyone? They learned it all. See, they're good. All right, Nora's going to ask a question. All right, good. Very good. That might get it rolling. The question. I might not know the answer, but... This is something I've always been wondering. So why do you have a different colored shirt than, like, Eric? Mm. <laughs> good, good, good. Um, you know, first of all, I don't have to wear this color all the time. Sometimes I will wear a, a black shirt. Let me start with the black, which is the black, you know, is, comes out of the monastic tradition and is part of the habit. So if you were wearing... Um, before we started wearing suits, right, you would, be, you would have um, your cassock on, 
And so you'd have this black cassock on, and, and if you were ordained, you'd have a collar. And so the black was just the standard uh, way one would look. And then when, when you started wearing a suit, uh, you'd get a shirt instead of a... So um, we do... It, it, um, the first part of... It's sort of embarrassing to talk about this part of it. But, but one of the ways that um, bishops... And this started with the Orthodox and the uh, Roman Catholics. So we're not to blame for this, um, for this thing. They are. Uh, although we're still doing it, uh, which is to say that, that purple was, was a color associated with royalty or with, uh, or with a hierarchy of some sort, right? Purple was a more expensive cloth, and so um, the church early on, um, by saying, you know, we, our authority is in the bishop and not the king, um, and that's why, you know, you'll see, you know, the whole genuflecting thing, right, started as a part of, um, you see, you know, you all know what genuflecting is. People do it in some churches where they, you know, or, or they do this. And that, that came from, you know, it, the, you know, the Roman soldiers would, you know, come before the, their, their, uh, their well, for Caesar, of course, but, but, if, but any, any higher ranking um, person in the military and, you know, sort of, you know, my lord, and so the, the church adopted, you know, we, we, don't, we, don't, we don't bow towards or genuflect to that, to Caesar or the Romans. We do that in our church. We, we, this, is our, this is our Lord. Jesus is Lord, not, not Caesar. Or not. So those actions of, I'm getting a little far afield from the color of the shirt, but, but, um, but just to say that the context is that we, we carried over into the church, these are the loyalties. And so... Um, um, some mitres even early on, the hat, um, the, the, the early popes and stuff, they were actually crowns. I mean, so it's like this is the prince of the church, not, not, that, not that Caesar dude or anybody out there. It's here. So the color carried over is a way of distinguishing um, the bishop from the other clergy. Sometimes I'm not, um, I, I don't, sometimes I just wear black because it's just certainly appropriate for all clergy to wear black. Um, so that's the sort of long way around. It's just, there are a couple different colors of purple you'll see people wearing. It doesn't mean anything different. It's just, I happen to order this color from that one, and someone else ordered a darker purple. Um, but it's just, uh, it's become now uh, custom in, 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 in uh, a lot of churches. And this is the color that just designates bishop, right? So you can tell who he is. A lot, again, a lot of the things that we wear designate who's doing what. That's why we still use those vestments. In these churches, uh, the Roman church, the Orthodox church, many Lutherans, um, some Methodists, we still wear the traditional vestments of, of a time. Uh, in many other churches, they don't wear, like the Baptists don't wear any vestments. Might, might wear a preaching robe, but not, but not a vestment. Right? So vestments are also another carryover to uh, acknowledging that there was this tradition that we're not changing much. And what a person's wearing, if a person's wearing the, uh, a stole across her chest, she's a deacon. If a person is wearing the chasuble, like I'll be wearing this morning, which is that overgarment, that's the person who's going to celebrate communion, right? And the other clergy who are just wearing a stole are not today. So, some of those things just point to what's going on. So in the churches where you have big Gothic cathedrals and stuff in um, much of our history, you could look up and you could kind of tell um, who was doing what and why. So, the, the, so when it was way down there, you know, in a big Gothic church, some of y'all have been in a big Gothic church, right, in Europe or even in this country, maybe National Cathedral, you know, you might not be able to tell, where's the bishop? Who, who's the priest? Who's the celebrant? And those are just visible signs. So... Yeah, it's pretty though. Yeah, that's a great nice. question. Nice. <laughs> so you, we don't have um, deacons here at St. John except today. And um, Melissa is a deacon, a permanent deacon. Uh, most clergy, or priests rather, um, are deacons for a bit of time. Transitioning. And, and we call it transitional deacons. Um, but she's, her entire role is being a deacon. Well, I, is it okay if I give her the mic for a moment? Yes, and talk about that'd be great. What she does and she's with us? Yeah. And maybe we could work on you, we could work on you having a deacon from time to time, maybe. Um, <laughs> a, a deacon is not the shepherd of a flock, doesn't have a congregation, but your ministry is out in the world. 
and uh, deacons are handled differently in different dioceses. We right now in this diocese tend not to be embedded in a parish because what happens when you're embedded in a parish, you sort of become quasi assistant priests. So we really want deacons to be freed up to do social justice ministries and, and things out in the world and to be an icon for that for other people's missional work. I have very specific things I do in the liturgy and you'll see me do that today. Um, I'm not sure if I'm gonna be carrying in the gospel book. Typically, I carry in the gospel book. Um, I'm gonna read the gospel, proclaim the gospel, and I'm gonna set the table and give the dismissal. Sometimes I do other things as well. But the, the majority of my ministry is out in the world. And as a matter of fact, I'm a clinical social worker and I do that ministry out in the world too. Thank you, Melissa. Yeah. That's a good way of talking about, off your question about color, there are distinct ministries. In other words, the deacon has a distinct ministry in the church, the priest has a distinct ministry in the church, and the bishop has a distinct ministry in the church. And all of you lay people have a distinct ministry in the church. They're all orders of ministry. Again, we're all baptized into Christ. Just because I have on a purple shirt doesn't make me any more of a Christian than you are. It just means that the church has said, okay, you in the purple shirt, that's what you're going to do, right? You're going to do these things. Eric's not going to have to do them. Uh, you know, Melissa's going to do these things. And, and, and I don't, you know, when a deacon's in liturgy, no one else reads the gospel, right? The deacon reads the gospel. So there are, and sometimes we take on, again, when the bishop's present, the bishop celebrates communion, not the priest, right? So that's just the way it goes. And so when I'm not here, um, Eric and the other uh, clergy here uh, are deputized, right, to perform uh, the rites of the church other than those uh, things like confirmation or ordination that are not designated to them. So some of it's just church order. It doesn't, in the, in the larger sense, it doesn't make any difference. Uh, in, this, in, the, in the more uh, technical sense, it does, because we say this is the way uh, we have received this faith, and we're, we're, and we're keeping at it. Right? We're not changing it. Um, please. I have a question about I'm going to give, I'm gonna give you the mic. Because we're, record, we're recording. <laughs> this this is from a long time. I was kind of when I was 18 and I remember we had to wear as the Catholic Church did to a head covering oh really why did we ever have to do that I'm not sure about a head covering but I will I'll, them, I guess. I'll venture I'll venture into was it white Mostly. yeah I'll venture into just what I think it's a little bit about um, but but I could be wrong uh, which is uh, quite often uh, but but first of all, the, um, just like in baptism, uh, in baptism, a lot of converts, and, and again in the early church, and a lot of, uh, maybe even the Baptist church, you all have to put on, a, do you put on a white robe? Do you remember that? So, so the color, so baptism really, like if you're a little baby, you know, you get a white uh, gown, right, a baptismal gown. Uh, really, um, if, you were, if we were really being uh, really literal about it, everybody who was being baptized would, would wear an alb or a white garment because that's a baptismal garment. When any priest, deacon, or bishop is ordained, they come to the ordination in just a white garment, right? And then they put on other, other pieces. So, um, so it could have to do with um, the, the echoes of baptism and purity. I mean, so that um, it, it was just the women who had to do it, right? Right, and it was a, like a and the young, Yeah, a what? A, you know, the lace. Yeah, yeah. Thing. So there's, there's some of that, I'm not, I'm not going to venture too much on that, but there's some of that sort of uh, uh, male-dominated, women should be covered kind of stuff that was still uh, going on, you know, um, which again had to do with purity, uh, had to do with uh, virginal kinds of things, and that, um, you know, uh, you all can decide for better or for worse whether we uh, should be doing that or not. Um, but, but that's what I would venture about it. It was, that it, was a, it was a practice of the wearing white first and then maybe designating that these girls are, are pure in this moment. And, and it was, that was also true with, with the bridal veil too, right? That, that, that there's this pure um, veiled uh, that comes out of a kind of pure monastic kind of uh, 
bride for Christ, kind of that, that stuff. That's my best guess. Anybody else? Some of it. Are we getting up on time? We have Still like good. ten okay. minutes, y'all. Oh, good, you, good. Got, you got the bishop here. I mean, I'll just, I'll just, I'll just crack off on some other stuff. If can you tell you us want, um, if, if no one has any other questions, they're burning to be about. Yeah, I don't see anything. So, in the diocese right now, mm -hmm. what are you kind of most excited about? Y'all just spent a portion of the week um, in, yeah. a, in a certain area of the diocese. Would you tell us that? Yeah. Anything that uh, you think? Uh, so we, as a. Um, Again, um, those of you who are either new to the Episcopal Church or, or younger people, a diocese is a, um, an area, right? It's just a region. And um, so in this, um, this diocese is southwestern Virginia. It's all the way from uh, Stanton and Waynesboro, uh, down past Lynchburg to Martinsville, all the way over to Bristol, back up the... Uh, West Virginia border up to uh, passing Blacksburg and, and the coal fields and past Roanoke and on back up to Bluegrass. So in these, um, we call that a diocese is just uh, our word for that region, right? And other denominations call them a conference or a, um, and, and I'm like the um, governor uh, of the region, right? We have 55 churches and my role is to uh, resource and support, and maybe even sometimes uh, uh, guide. Uh, I oftentimes guide and then look back and no one's there. But, uh, but, uh, but as a sort of, you know, to chart some kind of course for where we're going. Um, and um, so as a diocese, I can't do that all by myself, so I have a staff and some people who have distinct ministries within um, um, in that sort of resourcing thing that we're doing. So because Melissa's here, I'll just point to one, which will make the, will both um, describe uh, what I'm trying to get at in terms of a diocese's function, and we'll say something about what we're, uh, a, um, a recent thing that we're really about. So the, our presiding bishop, uh, who will be here, at our, it's the 100th anniversary of this diocese, and uh, we were founded in 1919 out of the diocese of Southern Virginia and Virginia. And there are three dioceses in Virginia. And um, we'll celebrate 100 years uh, in 2019. And one of the, our presiding bishop will be here, and one of his, the focuses of his ministry is racial reconciliation. Uh, our, our presiding bishop is the first African-American presiding bishop of the Episcopal Church. And uh, he has a strong um, um, conviction, and not only is he a, uh, a street-preaching gospel uh, uh, a minister, but he also brings a strong um, uh, emphasis on um, the, the racial divide and the racial uh, work that we sorely need to continue to be about in this country. So one of his things is he's, he's named this initiative Proclaiming Beloved Community, and it's a series of, of ways that we will get in touch with um, uh, the racial structures that we are either a part of, uh, whether we know that or not, uh, and, and in ways that we might pray, um, uh, ask for forgiveness about, learn about. So we're doing a number of things in this diocese. We've had, uh, we've had uh, three or four conversations, uh, civil discourses on race. Uh, we're going to be having some uh, pilgrimages coming up where we might visit sites. For instance, we're working on a pilgrimage um, that's going to be in the Withville area, which is where one of the last um, people or the last person in Virginia was lynched. So that's tough, really tough work, but it's work that, the, that, the, that we as the Episcopal Church and we as the church need to be about, that tough, um, painful work of saying, this is, a, this is a sorry part of our human journey, and, and we're acknowledging it instead of saying that didn't happen. That, that's not about us. So we're looking for ways, and it's this initiative, um, when Melissa Hayes-Smith talked about a deacon being out in the world, this is one of the things that Melissa's working on. Uh, to, uh, she's, she's engaging with community leaders when we had um, the, con the 
conversation on race in this um, city. It was, it was the name of the community center? I'm forgetting. Northwest Community Center. So we invited members of that community and from around the diocese and, and Dr. Wernie Reed, who uh, is from Virginia Tech. Uh, he's a, a number of things, but he's um, a professor of, of Africana Studies and Social Justice Network. I forget that. He's got like three or four different social policy research. He's got a number of titles. So he came over and spoke to us. So there are a number of things that we're doing like that, to, which we're excited about. Uh, it's challenging. Uh, it's um, sometimes it's just challenging. Sometimes it's challenging and renewing. Like people go away from a conversation, going, "Oh, I was glad we could at least talk." Um, you know that we've had a lot of uh, since Charlottesville. Uh, we've had a lot of um, challenge, especially in this part of the uh, Virginia. I mean, we have a, you all may have been tracking that we had a church in Lexington named R. E. Lee Memorial. Uh, we, they've, cha- they've come together and are still trying to heal from that, but they changed the name of their church back to its original name, which is Grace. That was a challenging um, journey, um, but uh, we were able to, and we had, we had one of the discourses on race in Lexington. Um, it was peaceful, uh, standing room only, but a lot of people really wanted to come and talk about um, some of the vestiges of uh, of, of, the, of the Civil War, of, of uh, racism in their community. And we didn't go into these, com- we don't go into these communities in, in, our, in the cities and towns around our diocese saying, here's what you need to do. We go in and we just try to open up conversation and try to um, uh, create experiences like the pilgrimage um, to this uh, lynching site, the granddaughter of, of this person who's lynched is still alive. We'll go to the grave. We will pray. Uh, we'll be people who, who witness uh, and, and, um, and ask for forgiveness. Um, so that, if you have questions about that work, I don't know if I can deal with that in 10 minutes. Another, but another thing we're doing is we are working, we've been working for two years um, with the missional network we have six pilot congregations that are working to try to experiment with new ways of, of reaching beyond the walls of the church. So um, they are, and are, there's one in every one of our convocations. Our diocese is split up into five areas. And they're experimenting with new ways of trying to reach out. Uh, a lot of our churches, like this one, are reaching out in lots of different ways. But there might be a new thing to try. And, that's what the, and, so, um, and we're learning how to, how to do that in new ways. So that's an exciting thing. The thing that, um, that Eric uh, pointed to, we were just in, a, in Augusta, which was, we were in Stanton mostly. We're, we're taking the whole staff to different areas of the diocese um, so that the staff is coming to those areas. I mean, you all and the churches that are in Roanoke or surrounds, you don't ever have this issue. You're like, you're not the ones who go, why do we always have to whatever Roanoke? Uh, you're like, duh, Roanoke, that's awesome. But, but in other places, the diocese, right, it's like, we're on a, uh, you know, like, well, why do we always have to go up there? And, you know, why is it always about Roanoke? So we're trying to, to go to other parts of our diocese and say, instead of you having to come down here for a meeting with either Melissa or me or the other canons, we'll come up there. So we spent three days uh, um, just um, staying at a guest house at Stewart Hall, one of our Episcopal schools, and we just had lots of meetings with groups, with clergy, with individuals. We did various things, and then we concluded with worship. So we all came together in Emmanuel Stanton, and we worshiped together. And we're going to do that in all the other um, areas of the diocese. We won't be doing it here because here we are. But we might think about having a, 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 an evening prayer, a worship service for our convocation. That may be the one thing, the piece that we're taking to other places we might do here. Uh, I, I'm sensing that's about time. We, we probably are at that point. Is anything that somebody just on the edge of your seat to ask a question? I can tell that that's not going to happen. I want to say this, particularly <laughs> to the young people here, that you'll every now and then I'll come across, maybe you've heard this as well, somebody almost like they remember their confirmation is almost like graduation from, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> from <laughs> in some way. And what I will, if you're graduating you're only graduating into a new way of being a a leader within this church. Mm -hmm. This church does amazing good for Roanoke. 
This church does amazing good for our diocese. This church does amazing good around the world in places like Haiti and Ghana. And what I want you to, to, to kind of own, and it may feel you know, weird as a, as a 13, 14 year old, but I want you to, to own the fact that this is the legacy that you're being handed. And um, you also have this new kind of responsibility and so whatever we're graduating, if we're going to use that term at all, it's graduating into a new sort of church leadership. Now, of course, our adults um, that are being confirmed and received, we certainly welcome you and want that for you as well. But young people, this will be your church one day, and in fact, it right now is. And so I hope that you'll just kind of use this day to allow your imaginations to... to, to take hold and maybe one day like the bishop said he he just kind of was going along for the ride and got confirmed and he ended up a bishop so who knows <laughs> maybe you'll do that yeah. as well i um, proud of you and one thing about you young people you know there is this church which is saint john's but there's the church which is the larger church and i think right now more than any you know um the the response the courage the bravery the conviction of young people um, especially after the Parkland shootings and stuff. I mean, young people uh, have the ability to uh, lead us uh, older, set in our ways, uh, folks, into uh, maybe the vision that God has uh, for, for the church and for the world. So don't think as those uh, students who all went to D.C. Um, um, to speak against uh, gun violence in their schools, uh, they're the ones that got active, right? And so one of the things when, you're, um, when we're renewing our baptismal covenant, you say that you will uh, promise to strive for justice and peace. So I just wanted to put a, like a, an actual thing on that. Sometimes all this stuff can sound a little bit like, yeah, 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 whatever. Um, but but I mean, if you think about, you say, I will strive for justice and peace. What's that look like? Well, it means that I'll stand up with my friends in school and we'll say no to right. you adults because we don't like it. You need to change it. So that's exactly. so. This mission is yours. The age is not a yeah. not a limitation. And we we need to, to to learn from you. So it's going to be a great service. Everybody, we'll see you there. See you in a few okay? minutes.